Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. The impacts of invasive species can be found here and throughout the country. Forests, agriculture lands, and waterways are each vulnerable to some animals or plants from another region of the world that are not native to their new environment. These invasives cause cause ecological or economic harms, and sometimes both. For our first segment today, we join scientists from Lake Champlain Sea Grant Institute who are researching dozens of aquatic invasive species that have found their way into the lake, and they need our help to be on the lookout for four additional species that have now been found in nearby waterways. Aquatic invasive species are animals, plants, and other organisms living in the water that have established populations outside of their traditional geographic range, often as a result of human actions. They can be harmful to native species and people alike. Aquatic invasive species generally lack natural predators or they have the ability to outcompete similar native species. As a result, if they're introduced into a water body, their populations explode. These overpopulations can interfere with recreational fishing activities, boating activities, water intakes, and they can also raise havoc with native species biodiversity. Many aquatic invasive species that are native to places such as Europe and Asia got a foothold in North America when they were imported in ballast water of commercial ships. Ballast is fresher salt water pumped into the cargo hold of a ship to make the ship more stable when they're empty. Non-native species of plants and animals can also be introduced by people who have water gardens, aquariums, or exotic pets, and release them into the environment. An example is the Burmese python in the Florida Everglades. Today in the Lake Champlain Basin, a common mode of uh, invasive species transport are recreational boats moving from places like southern New England, mid-Atlantic states, the Finger Lakes in New York, uh, even the Great Lakes, and potentially bringing invasive species to Lake Champlain. And another vector that people are probably unaware of is the Champlain Canal, which provides a direct connection from the Hudson drainage to the Lake Champlain drainage. Oftentimes, aquatic invasive plants can reproduce with just a fragment of the plant, and aquatic invasive animals have life stages that are invisible to the naked eye. As a result, if an angler transports water in a live well, or if a watercraft or a trailer snags a plant fragment, small-bodied organisms and plants may be inadvertently introduced to new water bodies, and if that happens, they can establish new nuisance populations. Lake stewards greet recreational boaters at boat ramps throughout the Lake Champlain watershed. They inspect boats and trailers and speak with people to learn if they have inspected and cleaned their watercraft and trailer and allowed it to dry for at least three days. Boat wash stations are also available at five locations on Lake Champlain. Automatic car wash businesses have partnered to further help reduce the spread of aquatic invasive species. Compared to the Great Lakes, which have at least 187 known aquatic invasive species, Lake Champlain is doing much better, with only 51. But, each additional aquatic invasive species brings its own impacts. So, the goal is to keep new ones from becoming established. Unfortunately, once an aquatic invasive species is in a water body, it's difficult, if not impossible, to eradicate it. The best action we can take is to prevent introduction of these species to water bodies in the first place. The latest aquatic invasive species to be found in Lake Champlain was the fish hook water flea in fall of 2018. These tiny aquatic animals outcompete and prey on native zooplankton and are not a very good food source for fish, resulting in food web impacts. They also clog fishing lines, which therefore hinders uh, recreational, charter, and tournament fishing opportunities. Of particular concern are four invasive species that exist in nearby watersheds, but haven't established themselves in Lake Champlain yet. The public is asked to keep an eye out for these and to report any possible sightings. The species of most concern now include two fish species, Eurasian ruff and round goby, 
one plant species, hydrilla, and one mussel species, quagga mussels. Lake Champlain is a natural treasure. We all have a part to play in protecting it and the waters that drain to it, now and into the future, including keeping a close eye on aquatic species, especially by cleaning and drying your boat, kayak, or other recreational vessel between excursions. This video was produced by Lake Champlain Sea Grant, a partnership among the University of Vermont, SUNY Plattsburgh, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. To learn more about Lake Champlain Sea Grant and to see other videos in this series, please visit our website. There is another invasive in the lake that the Sea Grant Institute is raising awareness about. This one is man-made. Rebecca Gollin has the story. There's a mystery in Lake Champlain. Is it a film? Is it a bead? Is it a fiber, fragment, foam? It is tiny pieces of plastic that researchers started noticing in the early 2000s, first in ocean waters and later in the Great Lakes and Lake Champlain. These particles are less than five millimeters in size. That's smaller than a pencil eraser. The first project and probably the longest running was the wastewater treatment plant processing. So Danielle um, Garneau is a professor of environmental longest, science at SUNY Plattsburgh. She's leading a study investigating the distribution of the plastic particles, or microplastics, around the lake, both in the water and also in the animals who live here. We've got invertebrates, uh, macroinvertebrates, we've got 14 species of fish and our top predator would be the cormorants. Um, and so these are all the lake species we've worked with, about 19 species, 14 species specifically are, are fish. The research started several years ago, testing water that was treated at the local wastewater treatment facility. We started doing uh, wastewater treatment plant surveys at the Plattsburgh City Plant. Um, we basically will go out with a 355 micron um, sieve and we'll place it under um, a hose that's pulling water from the last um, portion of processing at a plant right before it goes out into the lake. The study recently expanded from Plattsburgh to include wastewater treatment plants in Burlington and St. Albans, with Garneau's team taking samples weekly at each location, as well as several sites within the lake. As you can see from these pie charts, we're getting a lot of fragments, so that's in orange here, um, and this is 2015 and 16 samples. One concern is that accumulation of the microplastics in larger fish and predators will have a negative impact on their health. A lot of these plastics have plasticizers and other um, additional you know, additives, the BPA, um, and so on, and those things, are they, are they leaching out into the other tissues, making it through the bloodstream um, and impacting, you know, neurologically? And again, findings, early findings in, in many organisms are showing some signs that these aren't necessarily a healthy thing for these organisms. Another piece of the puzzle is determining exactly what kind of plastic each tiny particle came from in the first place. There's so many thousands of kinds of plastics uh, that are out there, different polymers, different types of plastics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the meander is really that, that S shape yeah. that, that rivers are going to create. Slowing Chris Stepanuk is a professor and researcher at the are, University of Vermont. She's part of the Lake Champlain Sea Grant, which is funding Garneau's research on microplastics. What Danielle is finding is that the dominant kind of plastics or microplastics in the lake are fibers. So those are coming from textiles, maybe like our fleece jackets, or from ropes or other uh, plastic materials that are used in the lake or fishing or something like that. One source researchers have pinpointed is washing machines. One of the things that we've learned through different research studies is that different kinds of materials, and this is again the fibers being the most prevalent in Lake Champlain, um, when they're washed, they're shedding off pieces of, of plastic, uh, and that's getting again through the wastewater treatment system and out into the lake. The wastewater treatment facilities are not doing anything wrong. They're simply not set up to deal with such small particles. And while a few fibers getting free during a wash 
may not seem like a big deal. Studies have shown that an average size load of polyester cotton blend could release an estimated 137,000 fibers. Acrylic material, one of the worst offenders, can shed over 700,000 of the microscopic plastic fibers per load. You know, even though when we look at our sieve, when we pull it, it doesn't seem like a lot. You can imagine when we, you know, extrapolate out to, based on flow rates and many thinking about other plants that would be contributing as well. Um, this may this may become a, a larger problem in the lake. There are some products hitting the market that address the problem, like Patagonia's Guppy Friend washing bag and the Cora Ball from the Vermont-based Rosalia project. Long-term solutions could include working with washing machine manufacturers and retrofitting wastewater treatment plants to capture the smaller particles. So in terms of um, what our role can be, you know, just choosing to use um, alternatives or less plastic, you know, don't use the straws, um, switch over to more natural products when we're choosing face wash and toothpaste, you know, be a more aware consumer. That certainly is one of them. Maintenance, maintenance of our um, outerwear and our synthetic clothing. Um, and uh, also if we're, if you um, are out on the lake a lot, you know, making sure that your equipment is up to speed and you're not working with frayed ropes and, and those sorts of things. Solving a mystery and rethinking our relationship with the plastic we use and wear. Can we win the war on microplastics? It's going to be challenging. These researchers are up for the challenge and on the case. In Burlington, I'm Rebecca Gollan with Across the Fence. And that's our program for today. Once again, thank you for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well.